I'm Kathy King. I'm the Executive Director of Delivery Services at OCLC, and I'm going to be presenting today with Jennifer Corsi, who I think a lot of you do know. I am in a new role at OCLC, so I have been with OCLC for about three and a half years. For the first three years, I focused on our end user products, so WorldCat Discovery, WorldCat.org, First Search. Anybody here use First Search? Yeah, I know. Woohoo! <laughs> so I was part of the decision to keep First Search around forever, so we're super excited about that. So yes, First Search forever. <laughs> Um, actually, I was, gonna come, I was going to come to the conference that was in Virginia Beach a couple of years ago to talk all about First Search and get to meet all of you, but I, my flights were canceled. I think there was a snowstorm that, that week. Um, so I really want to get to know all of you, and I want you to get to know a lot about me. So I'm going to do something that I don't normally do. I'm going to talk a little bit more about myself than usual, so bear with me. And guess what? I have like 95 minutes to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Aaron, I know I promised I would only tell a few stories. <laughs> so, okay, let me see. Let's get started. All right, so what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about my background beyond what I've been doing at OCLC. Um, like I said, I'm in a new role, so uh, first three years on end user products, and then six months or so ago, we brought uh, end user and um, resource, sh resource sharing products together to form one team called Delivery Services. We did that so that we could focus on the end user journey from start to finish, from search and discovery all the way through to access. So a little bit about me. Um, I am the oldest of five kids. Anybody else here the oldest? There's a couple. Oh my gosh, look at all the oldest. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, so I um, am the product of uh, library reading programs. I spent a lot of the time in the library hiding from my younger siblings when I was a kid. And um, my library looks like this. So I grew up in a small town. And our public library was in a two-story Victorian building. And I went back. This is from 2016. Uh, went back to visit. And it was actually a funny story. You all appreciate this. Uh, all of my siblings and I went back. We all had our spouses. There were kids with us. And we're touring the library, because I was so excited to go back and visit as um, an OCLC employee. And uh, one of the librarians said to the other librarian, oh my gosh, there's so many people here. So many people. I'm so excited. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> so I introduced myself. And I said, you know, I work for OCLC. Um, have you ever heard of WorldCat? And um, she had not, which was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, back when I, again, back when I was a kid, um, I followed around the local librarian at this library because I really was, you know, I was into books, I loved libraries, I loved hiding from my siblings, and eventually she gave me a job. So I started my library career at this public library, and I don't actually even remember if she paid me for this job. So I filed cards in the card catalog, and I worked on the circulation desk, and this was around high school. Then I took a break from libraries, and I spent uh, most of my career, almost all of my career, till, that, till OCLC uh, in e-commerce. So I worked for large retail brands. You might recognize some of them, American Eagle Outfitters, DSW. Um, and my career trajectory in e-commerce actually looked a lot like it does at OCLC. So in the beginning days of e-commerce back in 2006, 2007, it was all about helping users find the thing that they needed, find the best thing. So um, we spent a lot of time optimizing search algorithms, implementing recommendation algorithms, things like that. And then along came, came Amazon and changed the expectation of users. So um, it was no longer OK for you to get your package in, well, seven days, 10 days, whatever we could afford from an e-commerce team perspective, from our budget perspective. We would ship these things kind of snail mail, really slow. Um, and then Amazon came around and drove this expectation that package delivery happens in, what, two days, one day? one hour. And then I spent a, a lot of time for five years or so working on fulfillment projects. So uh, looking at ways to turn 500 uh, library distribute 500 libraries, wow, see, I'm really ingrained, <laughs> 500 stores into um, fulfillment centers so that we could enable all kinds of different delivery options for users, get people things that they were looking for um, faster. So. Uh, that looks a lot like what I've been up to at OCLC, very focused on search and then now fulfillment. 
So um, about, I mentioned I'd been here for three and a half years ago, about three and a half years ago, I started to think, well, I need, I'm searching for some more purpose. I'm searching to do something that helps users versus, uh, or helps people, really, versus trying to figure out how to get money out of their wallet. That's, that's a lot of what you do in retail. We were coming up on the holiday season, and it's all about what projects do we have in order to take more money from people. It doesn't feel really good, right? I'm sure I don't have to tell you all that. You're all very purpose-driven. Um, so I was on LinkedIn, kind of looking for a new challenge, and uh, I saw a job uh, posting for OCLC. I had never heard of OCLC. I was already in Columbus, Ohio, where OCLC is headquartered, Dublin, Ohio. And I read through it, and it said, all, all I saw was, library, building software, gets to serve librarians. I was so excited. I called my mom. You know, you always, you always have that person that you call when something really exciting happens. So I tried to call my husband. He was at a meeting, so he didn't accept my call. So I called my mom, and I said, guess what, mom? There's this job out there. It's a company called OCLC, and it looks like my skill set actually fits really nicely, this retail skill set that I have, in with helping libraries. So I applied immediately, and um, sure enough, the next day they called me, and, and it turns out that my skill set really did sort of match in with what OCLC was trying to do with their end user products. <clears throat> well, fast forward to having to actually officially take the job. So that means I have to leave retail, my comfort zone, and do something new, even though it's something that was gonna drive a lot of purpose. And uh, my mother happened to be coming to visit me. She lives nine hours away. Uh, it was total coincidence on her way to visit. And I was also looking at another job that had me staying in retail. So I was gonna be working on some mobile apps for another company who I won't mention, who's a ugh, company. <laughs> And, <laughs> um, but that seemed interesting. That was inside my comfort zone. You know when you're sort of thinking like, do I step outside the comfort zone? Do I try something new? Um, and by the time my mom had driven across Pennsylvania to Ohio and she gets out of her car, I say, you know, I'm not gonna go to OCLC. I'm just too nervous, I'm too worried. I'm gonna stick with retail. And she said, oh, all right, okay. You know, whatever you wanna do, I support you. And then um, she said it in a way that made me feel like she was a little disappointed, you know, but that's okay. Um, so I went, I slept on it. I didn't call anybody, I didn't make any decisions. And the next day, I get up and I think like, no, I've got to do this. I've got to go work for OCLC to help serve libraries and to, and to really pursue a passion. And so I tell mom, I said, okay, mom, I'm going to go. And she goes, she says nothing, she goes to her car and she comes back and she brings me this little plaque here that sits on my desk. It says, it's a beautiful thing when a career and a passion come together. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, that's so, oh, whoops, sorry. Sorry about the microphone. They already yelled at me, my hair's in the way. Um, and I thought, like, oh my gosh, that's, that, I almost like was moved to tears because I was so excited to be come, coming to help libraries. And she said, yeah, I wasn't going to give you that if you stuck with retail. <laughs> <laughs> So I can honestly say that three and a half years later, OCLC is unlike any other company that I've worked for. It's unlike any other company in any of the other industries I've worked for, and it's really truly unique within the library industry in that its sole purpose and mission is to fulfill um, or to uh, help libraries and users and really to um, advance librarianship. And there are a lot of ways to describe OCLC. I like to describe it as a network. Have you heard this before, OCLC as a network? We were like the original network, right? Um, 18,000 members within this uh, community coming together to collaborate, to share ideas, and to innovate. And really that happens in three different ways. So I don't probably have to tell you this, but those three ways look like so metadata services. So libraries come together to share their collective creation of metadata. Resource sharing, of course, that's what we're all about here today. I was at ILL 101 this morning. So much excitement around sharing. I saw Megan Gaffney's presentation, really fantastic, lots of passion, loved it. Um, so there are 10,000 libraries across the globe in this network. Really, I think you were the original sharing economy. You hear about Uber and Lyft, and like, what about libraries, right? <laughs> um, and then the thing that drove, or. Uh, the thing that made me want to come to OCLC was all about discovery and discoverability. So you come together, you share all of this great metadata, you're sharing resources, but then you're actually making this available to essentially everybody to look at the world's largest library catalog. It's pretty amazing and impressive. And um, okay, I'm gonna tell you one more story. <laughs> 
Uh, I promise it won't take long. But I wanted to talk about the power of the network. And I, I realized the power of the network probably just a couple of weeks into working for OCLC. I don't think I really quite knew how powerful it was when I first left retail. Um, but I'll take you back to my last day at retail, which was a scary day again for me. And I was having those um, last day blues that you get when you're about to leave a place. Does anybody ever get those? A little bit, yeah. When you're kind of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm leaving and I'm really gonna miss this place and I'm gonna miss most of the people here. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> Um, and I was in a dear friend's office. Her name is Polly. She's fantastic. Uh, and Polly, she just looks at me and she goes, what are you talking about? Literally, just like that. We, are, we just sell shoes here. You are going to help people who cure cancer, who helped cure cancer, who serve those people. And that was particularly impactful because Polly had had cancer and beat it three times. Such an inspiration. And so I was thinking about Polly as I was um, in my first couple of months visiting libraries. So what I wanted to do when I first got to OCLC is I wanted to visit the libraries who were using WorldCat Discovery because that's the product that I was responsible for then. Anybody using WorldCat Discovery? A few people, yeah. So I, I went around and I um, visited libraries and I said, what's working, what's not working? Tell me where you want the future to go. And I heard a lot about relevancy. So we needed to improve our search algorithms, which is good because I had done that kind of thing before. And I was looking, so one of the ways you approach doing that is you sort of look through what are the searches that people are actually searching for. So I grabbed some anonymous data, looking for, through the searches, what were people searching for? And I saw things like plant-derived cancer treating agents and Hashimoto's and diabetes cures. It was really, really fascinating to see the power of this network coming together to serve people who are researching really important things. And, um, of course, we went on to use that data to make improvements for STEM, for STEM researchers, and I called Polly and I said, Polly, we're doing it. So I'm really excited about the power of this network. And I wanted to share with you a little bit about what we're doing to invest in, in such a powerful network. So the first thing we're doing is um, we are looking at linked data. So we're looking to enhance the bibliographic work that you all do as librarians. I saw some people raise their hand earlier today when Megan asked who was a cataloger. <laughs> so I'm sure you're excited about this. Um, we're looking to enhance that work and then also uh, research into what's possible and what's the future of metadata services. We're working on a project right now. You can check that. Check out more details on the website, oclc.org. We are um, investing in shared print. Right now we have a shared print program that allows libraries to come together and to talk about uh, their print holdings and to register commitments against monographs. So um, right now we have a project going to extend that program to allow libraries to collaborate on um, shared print retention for serials and multi-part monographs. So that's exciting. And I have to thank the Mellon Foundation who gave us a grant to work on that. And finally, I love that graphic, <laughs> so fun. Let me do it again. Delivery services. Oh, I went by fast that time. <laughs> so we are investing in the future of resource sharing, which we're calling delivery services. This whole user-centric um, mindset we're bringing towards delivery services and resource sharing. And we're investing in a world today where I think that uh, users' expectations that I talked about earlier that I was facing in retail, probably that resonated with you all, or at least some of you, where users expect right now for things to be convenient and they expect things to be at their fingertips and seamless. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> so we are investing in the future of resource sharing. And we're calling this vision the library on demand. We want to enable library on demand services for all of you who use OCLC services. Um, you're gonna hear a lot about this over the next couple of days, so I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about it now. What I really wanna talk about is how a lot of you have helped to inform this vision of where we're going for resource sharing. So when, about six months ago, when I first took on the role of delivery services, I did a very similar thing to when I joined OCLC. I went and started to talk to people. I visited with libraries, I visited with librarians. Librarians actually came to me in one case, so thank you if you did that. <laughs> um, we all traveled to Chicago to have a really great conversation about what the future of resource sharing is. And these are some of the folks that I got to talk to. That's not everybody, because you know, once you start putting too many logos on there, it was, it was blurring out. So I want to thank anybody who has hosted me or had a conversation with me about you know, what's working, not working, where the future is leading us. 
Um, Brian Miller at OC at OSU, I said, hey, can I come down and uh, learn more about your operations? He's like, sure, come on down. Spent five hours with me going over um, Iliad workflows, talking about user experience. It was a really great time. Um, really lucky to have them in our backyard. What I wanted to do was share some of the common themes that are coming out of those conversations. Because what I'd love to do is hear, are they resonating with you? Um, am I missing anything? That sort of thing. And continue this conversation beyond just me standing up here on stage. Because I'm going to take questions in a few minutes, um, ask what questions you have of me. But I'd really love to just this to be the beginning of the dialogue. So the first theme, I think I've sort of hinted at this, is all about user experience. So you really want to provide, from what I can tell, a more seamless user experience. Oftentimes, users have to do things like run their searches in multiple discovery environments. Um, today it came up that you know, you've got requests for people who, um, asking for things that are in your catalog. And so wouldn't it be great if we could avoid that? Um, multiple accounts exist, so I have to go one place to see my circulation requests or transactions, another place to see my ILL transactions. And oh, by the way, sometimes it can be confusing to a user how long they're allowed to keep something and you know, um, how long is it going to take to get them, is it ever going to get to them, that sort of thing. So I'd love to work with all of you to build a better, more seamless user experience. The other thing I heard over the last six months, and even again this morning, is flexibility is really important in the systems that you use. You are solving similar problems, of course, but the way in which you solve them, or the staff that you have, or the policies that you have, mean that you solve them in slightly different ways. So you need flexible and customizable solutions. Automation comes up over and over and over again. Automate as much as we can. And that's, that's so that you can spend that time working on that detective work that we talked about this morning. So let me spend the time on the things that I really need to put my expertise to and automate everything I don't need to see. So what is that balance? There is a balance there. And I think that um, some people would say it's more automation, less automation. I don't know, but let's figure that out together. The other thing is around, I heard over and over again, around transparency and collaboration. So um, a lot of people expressed an interest in collaborating closer with OCLC as we build out your products. And uh, as we build out those products, could you be more transparent about it too? <laughs> And wouldn't that be great? Um, so we're putting in place a lot of programs to increase our transparency and our collaboration with you. We'd like to have you up, involved more upfront in the process of building out our software. And if you don't have time for that, we'd also like to just be more transparent about it. What are we up to? How are we approaching problems? Um, in the WorldCat discovery space, one of the ways we solved this is we implemented a blog post. Uh, a blog post, a series of blogs. Um, we have a series of blogs that we talk about, you know, what's the latest enhancements, how have we prioritized those, how are we approaching solving the problem, what focus groups are going to be available to help us solve that problem in surveys. So we're looking to do the same thing uh, on the resource sharing side with Tapasa. The other thing is that I heard uh, along this theme is that I'd really like to see Tapasa. Um, I'd like to get in there and play with it. Well, today, or no, it's not today, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll have office hours where you can go and just play around with Tapasa, let the product team know what, what's your feedback, what's working, what's not working, that kind of thing. We're seeking this feedback. We really want to work with you all. And then finally, I've heard a lot of excitement. People are really excited about the future of OCLC, no, the future of OCLC, future of resource sharing. Where are we going? How are we going to build a seamless uh, experience for users? Is anybody else excited about where we could possibly go with, with resource sharing? Yeah, yeah, some nods, some nods. Yes! <laughs> I know it's after the lunch. The lunch spot is kind of sometimes tough, but it's okay. We can handle it. <laughs> so those were the top five themes that I heard. There were a lot of other themes, and you've told me a lot of other things, but those are the things that we're choosing to focus on, at least for right now. Um, and so I'm going to move on from that and talk a little bit about our portfolio of products at a very high, very high level, because you know this more than I do. And then Jennifer is going to come up and talk to you about the roadmaps. What do we have coming up in the next 6, 12 months against those products? So um, this shouldn't be surprising to anybody. We have several products in our portfolio for resource sharing. World Share ILL, of course, many of you know. Many of you know about it. Um, it plays a critical role for uh, in resource sharing for thousands of libraries, providing core ILL capabilities. 
Of course, we've got Tapasa, which is a new ILL management system that allows uh, lenders and borrowers to integrate with third-party systems, among other things, also provides an exceptional user experience. And of course, we also have Iliad that provides a very similar set of capabilities, only in a client-server environment. And then we have Relay Data D, which is a best-in-class, uh, really fantastic product um, for consortial borrowing, which allows, of course, groups of libraries to come together and optimize how they share their collections with one another. And finally, before I pause for questions or discussions or thoughts, I wanted to share our approach. How is OCLC going to approach building out these enhancements for, the pro for these products? And um, we really wanted to take a step back and think intentionally, what are our principles of execution? And we landed on these three. And in the spirit of being transparent, we wanted to share them with you. And again, if you see us wandering around the halls and you have feedback about any of this, please feel free to let us know. The first uh, pill, you know, guideline, guideline, principle of execution. <laughs> we debated what to call these. Our first principle of execution is build great user experiences. So think about the user journey from start to finish. And when I say user journey, I don't mean just end user. I mean the librarian journey as well. How can we make things more seamless on both the end user side and the librarian side as you go about your, your work? We want to collaborate with you all in the community and make sure that we bring data to the table to help inform discussions. We want to, with every enhancement, ensure that we're moving more towards making resource sharing, helping delivery be more fast and predictable for your users using automation, removing points of friction, and being more transparent. And then, and then, of course, interoperability is really important. There's a large ecosystem of resource sharing applications out there. We want to make sure that we are inter interoperating with those products both inside and outside of OCLC. And that, that will leverage things like standards and APIs. Make sense? So that's a little bit about me, a little bit about what I've been up to and where we're going. And I'm going to talk more about it on Thursday. OK. I think I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. After Jennifer's done, I'm going to come back up and we'll take more questions. So thank you, everybody. All right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the details um, and share some more information about World Trial LL, Tapasa, um, Iliad, as well as D2D. &D. Um, and Kathy talked about our approach, so I'm going to narrow in on some of these particular kind of strategic focus areas to give you some more feedback on those. Starting with interoperability, which we know is key for ILL librarians. You folks aren't just using your ILL software to solve your everyday problems you have to connect with other systems. Search places to find the things that your patrons need, to maybe buy the things that your patrons need. So those integrations into those other networks, those other pieces of software, we know are, are very key to getting your job done. So some of the things that we have been working on most recently with um, Tapasa in particular, um, we have Google Links integrated in our software, and we have integration with Rapid ILL as well as with Bscan and the ScanX software, and we've had those in place for a while now. Um, within the last six months or so, we've been working to pull in the local holdings and availability information for um, starting with our WMS circulation users, more recently with Alma, and we're currently working on doing those integration pieces for our Sierra libraries. Much more recently, with Reprints Desk, we did some exciting integration with that software so that libraries can send purchase requests over to Reprints Desk, and they will fill those articles via article exchange and just systematically and automatically send them on to your patrons without any further borrowing library um, touching needed, so that interoperability and that automation, which we know is key to that fast delivery of services to your patrons. And then again, more recently, we've been working on NSIP circulation integration, um, first with our WMS libraries last summer, and more recently with our Tapasa Alma libraries. And I'll share some more information about that in just a moment. And upcoming in the next 12 months or so, we'll be doing some more focus on Tapasa APIs. And Kathy talked to you a little bit about APIs, um, but also the new ISO protocol. So to focus in on our um, NSIP update and what we did with our integration with Tapasa and NSIP. 
So as many of you know, NSIP is the uh, NISO circulation interchange protocol, or shorthand is you know, circulation integration. It's that way to keep your ILL system and your circulation system up to date for those returnables that you are doing, um, for those two systems to talk and keep those, those items up to date. It allows for the creation of temporary item records um, and for checking those out and putting a hold on them for your patron. And then automatically updating those circulation records at check in and check out. And then if you choose, it also allows for fiscal transactions to be passed through. So for example, the um, charge that a lender might charge you, you can pass that into your circulation system for your patron. Specifically for Tapasa, this is how we did the integration. And again, um, it's for our WMS as well as our Tapasa Alma libraries. So when the item is received in Tapasa, we can create that temporary item record and we can place a hold on it in the circulation system for your patron. When you return it into PASA, we go ahead and we check it back in in circulation. And then optionally, when the lender ships it, if you want to pass through a lending charge to your patron, you can. That's something we don't see a lot of US libraries using, but it is something that they use internationally um, quite a bit. And then on the lending side, the options are when it's shipped into PASA, it's checked out in circulation, and when it's completed, it's checked back in. I want to focus a little bit on the actual um, configuration on how we have done this, because one of the key focus areas that we have for TAPASA um, in general is making those integration points easier, making um, it easier for libraries to turn on these integrations and not to do a lot of IT and um, heavy lifting on their side. So we want to make the configuration as easy as possible. So this in particular is the screen for the Alma and SIP integration. And highlighting on the first section, which is the server details, of course, you need to tell us the address of your Alma server and what your Alma institution code is so that we can um, pursue that interaction. But then you've got options. So within the borrowing workflow, you choose the pieces that you want to use. And this is great for um, as you're implementing it, because we do find that when libraries are doing the circulation integration, it means talking to the rest of the folks in the libraries. You have to talk about your processes and, and how you want to maybe change workflows to accommodate this. Um, so we have a set of um, pilot libraries that are doing the Alma integration now, and they're helping us with documentation on the um, Ex Libre side, as well as you know, some of the process changes that they're talking about and making within their libraries. So they've wanted to turn things on in, in bits and pieces to work it through the system. So on the borrowing side, you can turn on the creation of the temp record. Um, you can choose to use the supplier's barcode for your temp item record number, or you can use the request ID, your choice. Um, and then you can choose if you want to check it in and if you want to um, charge the patron on shipped. And then similar for the lending side. You can choose those pieces that you want to turn on. You can turn on a piece at a time, or we have some libraries who only one set of workflows really works in their library. So we want to make it as easy as possible for you to use these integrations um, and to make the setup um, as easy as possible as well. Another key area of integration and interoperability is um, the new ISO protocol that has recently been written. So it's officially called ISO 18626, um, and it's the Information and Documentation Interlarry Loan Transactions. So basically, it's a new protocol, and it's designed specifically for ILL transactions. There is an old protocol in place now, which is actually from the 1980s, and eventually this new one is going to replace that older standard. But what that means for the ILL community and why we are going to be focusing on it is it means better, more interoperability between ILL systems, that we're talking a similar language as we talk to each other about transactions. And it gives us that ability to move a request from one system to the next. Because again, we know that folks aren't just focused on one piece of ILL software, that often you're using multiple programs and multiple circles of lending libraries to move a request from one to another. So what we've done so far with this new protocol is um, last year in 2018, our Office of Research created this toolkit for implementing it. And this year, later on this summer, Tapasa is going to be the first OCLC product to integrate that toolkit into our software. 
And then D2D &D is going to do the same in the fall, so we can test with each other. We can um, determine if there are tweaks needed to that toolkit, if we had to make changes. We will test it out first, and then we are looking forward to sharing that information with the rest in the community um, so that we can begin to adopt the new standard throughout the resource sharing community. So the next key area of focus that I wanted to talk about was great user experiences. And great user experiences, um, of course, is focused on the patron side and making sure your patrons have great experiences, but it's also the staff side. Um, we want to make sure that the staff have great experiences. And one of the things um, that you folks need um, is reporting tools to have great experiences with those, because we know that everyone needs to be able to do that reporting, reporting within your library to show the value of the work that you're doing every day, and also to be able to share those kind of metrics within the community. So I'm really excited to um, share with you that very soon, within the coming weeks, we will be offering our WorldShare report designer tool to all Tapasa libraries. And this is a tool for building custom reports um, and visualizations specific to your library needs and those data points that you want to highlight. All Tapasa libraries, um, as do all World Trial L libraries and actually Iliad libraries, already have access to our um, kind of canned stats reports. There's 16 or so that are available, and Tapasa libraries will still have access to those reports, but they'll have this new tool um, coming very soon. We'll be sharing some more information in early April um, about the tool and the timeline for when we will be delivering that. We've been working internally on creating documentation, and we've got some training videos underway. We'll have a webinar next month where we introduce everyone to this tool, and we also plan to offer um, office hours where you can come and ask questions about the tool in particular. This is just one of the examples, um, a sample report from Report Designer. So let me highlight here, if you can see along the left-hand side, you have the ability to you know, pick the particular data elements that you want to use, the, the time frame that you want to pick, and you can pull all the data together in kind of a spreadsheet form that you're used to seeing. But you can also create these cool graphics. So there's pie charts and there's graph, um, graphs that you can create, you know, really to help visualize for your library, for your director, and again, within the community, some of the data elements and the points that are important for you to um, show the process and to show the work that you are doing um, within your teams and your libraries. So I'm really excited that we will be able to share this tool with all Tapasa libraries, um, and please do look for some more information about that in just the coming weeks. So the community center, and that is one of the places that we are able to share this information, but it's also one of um, the areas where we can share that kind of great user experience, so again, for, for staff users in particular. So the, our OCLC community centers we introduced um, several years ago, but it's an area for library staff to connect with their peers and to others that are using their particular ILL software products, but you also can connect to the OCLC product teams. We participate in those conversations in the community, um, and we try to jump in and answer questions as well for the discussions. And we also post news items so that we share information within those community centers. It's a way for you guys to collaborate, to share success stories, to share workflows um, that your library has tried out and has worked for you, or to ask other people for advice on workflows or how they handle a particular situation. And it's a way to contribute ideas and solutions. So enhancement requests. This is one way that we will gather your enhancement requests. Um, there's a particular page within the community center for you to submit those. And we also suggest that you go out and you look at the other enhancement requests that folks have put out there. And you can make your comments on those. And you can either write them to how much you agree or how strongly you feel about a particular um, enhancement request. So this um, is highlighting, so we do have in the community center, we have a community specifically for World Share ILL libraries, and we also have one for Tapasa libraries. And then a couple years ago, we added a Iliad to Tapasa community center. And that was specifically um, to give those Iliad libraries who wanted more information about Tapasa a place to ask questions, a place to volunteer for research, um, and a place to have discussion about certain feature sets. 
Some of the best practices around the community center is we really encourage you to complete a profile. So a profile can be simply your name and your library's name. You can add a picture if you like. It could be a picture of you. It could be a picture of your library. It could be a picture of your pet dog. Um, but just something to personalize it and to identify you. When you're posting discussion items or answering someone's questions, it's great to be able to see who this was coming from, what library they are, and have some kind of perspective on your viewpoint. We encourage you to subscribe to the discussion list so you can see the post from other libraries and it'll come directly into your email box. You don't have to go out to the community center and log in to see it. It will come directly into email. And also subscribe to news. News is the way that um, OCLC, that we share information about upcoming releases. We share information about webinars that we will be having. You'll, all, you'll get all of that via the news posts. And again, check out the enhancement page. You can add your comments. You can add additional enhancements. Um, and that's specifically for TAPASA and WorldShare ILL libraries. Um, Atlas folks have a specific user voice um, enhancement process on the Atlas site where you can submit your requests, um, your enhancement requests for Iliad. And it's a place that you register for events. So you get news about an upcoming webinar on our new report designer, and then you can register for that. Um, so you'll get reminded when it's coming up. And even if you can't attend the event, then you'll automatically get a recording of it so you can review it later. And coming soon, we are making a change to that Iliad to Tapasa community that we created a couple years ago. Um, we're actually going to be moving that. We're going to be moving that into the Tapasa Community Center as a specific research page. It'll still be a way to talk to other libraries, to ask questions about TAPASA functionality, um, to volunteer for research, but it'll live within the TAPASA community now. We're taking all of those discussions that were in that Iliad to TAPASA community, we're going to archive those and they'll all be accessible from within this new um, research page in the TAPASA community. And we'll have some more details and timelines to share about that um, at our next quarterly product upsite Upsights, Insights, which is coming um, next month, April 17th. All right, so that last kind of key focus area is fast and predictable. And one of the ways that OCLC, we try to be predictable with you is, is sharing the roadmaps, showing what we are planning to deliver in the coming months and what we're still researching. And we do that through the community center. Um, we do update our roadmaps there on a quarterly basis. But I'm going to go over with you a few highlights now um, for WorldShare ILL, TAPASA, Iliad, as well as D2D. So starting with WorldShare ILL, and we kind of have this laid out um, the last six months, so July through December of 2018. And we've got sections for deliver and sections for plan. So deliver are kind of the targets of the functionality that we want to deliver into the products in this time frame. The planning is the things that we are still defining and kind of finalizing requirements. Um, product development is a very iterative process. As we get things ready with all the requirements and all the details ready to give to our software developers so they can start coding the software and getting it ready to put into the system for you all, the product team is then working on the next thing that's coming down the line. And we're talking to libraries, we're working with our UX designers to finalize what this is supposed to look like, what is this button supposed to do. So the planning is happening before the delivery, but it's a very iterative um, process. So we kind of broke this down into, this is the stuff we want to release into the software in these time frames, and this is the stuff that we're working to refine um, at the same time. So I should have first talked about July through December of 2018. We um, delivered for WorldShare ILL staff notes, which we found to be hugely popular with WorldShare ILL as well as to PASA libraries. And that's just that ability to make additional notes for staff to put on a request about maybe conversations that you've had with a patron about that particular item or ways that you're trying to find it for a patron. And those staff notes are just internal to your particular institution. We've also um, made some interface changes, specifically for the purchase workflow, as well as to highlight some patron information. And that was in, specifically in response to um, 
libraries complaining about the, the amount of scrolling that they had to do, and some of these pieces were all the way at the bottom of the screen, so we tried to make the workflow so you had to do less scrolling, and those pieces of information you needed specifically about the patron to make decisions about how to get the item would be more um, apparent for you. And then earlier this year in our February release, we made some improvements to the unfilled request workflow to make it easier for libraries to um, resubmit a borrowing request if it had gone through the lender string and it was unfilled, but you still wanted to try and find that for the patron, we made it easier to just continue with that request without having to create a brand new request. And then coming in our release next month, we've got an email alert um, for borrowing requests if they've been filled via article exchange. And then later in June, we've got a, another email alert um, specifically for unfilled requests. And those are, alerts are designed more for the smaller libraries who may not be in the software every hour of every day um, to alert them to, hey, something's going on with your ILL transactions. You need to go over there and take a look. And then later on this year, again, that new ISO 18626 protocol is something that we will um, begin developing. And we plan to also add for wheelchair ILL libraries as additional reasons for no. We had a survey about um, reasons for no last year in response to libraries saying they need more options, and we got some good consensus and feedback, so I think there's three or four that we'll be adding later this year. So moving on next to Tapasa. Last year, again, we had the staff notes, those purchase um, interface improvements as well as the patron improvements, and then integration with reprints desk, which we actually did in the very beginning of January, but close enough. So again, that integration makes it very easy for Tapasa libraries to purchase a request from reprints desk. They are super quick on turnaround time with delivering those, and they deliver it via article exchange, so it automatically goes to your patron without you having to intervene, intervene at all. Unfilled request workflow improvements again for Tapasa libraries, and also in our most recent install, we, we started some infrastructure for branch workflows. Um, for supporting those libraries who have multi-locations and distance patrons, and this is something that we plan to have um, incremental changes coming throughout this calendar year. We're actually working with a branch workflows um, advisory group to give us feedback on the designs before we introduce them and to help us then prioritize the next pieces that are coming. And again, we'll be working with them probably throughout most of 2019 as we roll these changes out um, into PASA. And again, Report Designer is coming um, very soon for our Tapasa libraries, and that Alma and SIP integration, our pilot libraries are, we probably have four of the pilot libraries that are live with the integration now, and the other two will probably finish up in the next two weeks, so we'll have the full set of documentation um, and information that we can share with all Tapasa libraries so they can begin turning on that functionality as well. And then later, we're, we're planning and we're talking a little bit more about some automation. So automated tagging, the way to identify certain requests that fit within a certain workflow or process within your library. Tags are something libraries configure on their own and, and the syntax of what that tag says. And we want to find ways in Tapasa we can automate that more fully for our Tapasa libraries. So we're going to start with some display improvements to make those tags more visible, but then ways for libraries to automatically tag requests to fit into specific workflows. And again, that ISO integration, and we're going to work on that with our D2D libraries. And then Kathy mentioned APIs, which is um, kind of an application programmer interface, a way for um, one service to talk to another. We're working on our first iteration of that to be delivered in June, and we've been working with an API task force that's helped us define the requirements of what this API needs to look like, and they're um, kind of more on the technology side, so they're the folks who work um, like with the Iliad APIs and have some um, know-how in that kind of area. So they've been giving us feedback on you know, priorities of what we should work on, how the data should look like when it's returned to them, and there's things that the API can do. So if you're an institution and you want to create your own patron interface and you want to bring in your circulation items for your patrons as well as your ILL transactions for your patrons and maybe purchase transactions as well, but you want to present your own interface, the API is a way to pull data from Tapasa about your request there 
to add to your own user experience. So we'll be delivering the first piece in June, and it won't be available for all Tapasa libraries at that point. We'll, it'll be available for our API advisory group to give us feedback on you know, how the data looks, what you want the error messages to look like. And then we'll iterate upon that, and it's something that will likely happen over the next maybe six or eight months until we roll that out fully and have that available for all Tabasa libraries. Again, those branch workflows, that's something that we are going to continue to work on and iterate on as we talk with our branch workflows focus group to get those pieces out there for Tapasa libraries. Automated workflows is, is always a focus area to learn more, um, how we can introduce that, how we can make your job easier. And again, that ISO protocol again. So some of the things that we're still in the planning phase around um, and talking about um, our billing options. Uh, we know we've had some feedback from some of our libraries who are using the NSIP integration now that they want additional workflows. They want NSIP to handle recalls and renewals. So we're looking into some of that. We, we know we've got other library systems that Tapasa libraries would like us to integrate with um, on their circulation system. So we're looking at some of those, again, as well as the various pieces of the API that's going to continue to be fleshed out as we go forward the rest of this calendar year. So D to D, um, over the last six months or so, those folks have been busy. Um, they have focused on export request files, so that is something that's now available. Been working on some library privacy notices, as well as the ability to view and print pick slips and book bands. First half of 2019, um, they are looking to deliver the ability to uh, have patron request limits within the system and integration points. Integration points um, with Iliad as well as our own WMS system and WorldCat Discovery. And then the second half of 2019, again, I mentioned that we'll be doing some of that ISO um, interops testing with them as we flesh out the toolkit. They'll be doing some focus on staff search um, as well as modifying the, the routing lists and to do some more monitoring, some of that internal system work. And they're starting to think about planning of additional authentication options, as well as some of that big picture group to group requesting. And Iliad, let me get here so I can make sure I read Stephanie's notes. So um, targeting the Iliad 9.1 update for late August, the web pages are a focus area and want to, the folks at Atlas want to make them fully responsive for both mobile compliant and tablets as well as cell phones. They will have an entirely new look and feel, and they're working on some accessibility improvements for those pages as well. For the new authentication systems, um, Iliad is looking to support more integration with things like Open Athens, and also looking to find ways to reduce the patron rekeying of information if it's already known by the auth system. And automated user creation means more support for handling patrons who aren't in Iliad yet when they submit a request from outside the system using something like OpenURL or via the API. They're also looking to update the Rapid R integration. And Stephanie tells me to tell you to keep those user voice ideas coming, because um, they definitely use those in the planning as well. And actually, for all of our resource share sharing products, we use the enhancements and the things that you tell us are a priority um, as we develop these roadmaps and as we decide you know, which pieces to work on next. Your, your voice and, and your enhancement suggestions are, are key to helping us prioritize those things. 